So before we get started today, I want to acknowledge that OCAD is a settler organization. We are guests on this land which traditionally belongs to the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Haudenosaunee. And this land is governed by the Treaty of the Dish with One Spoon, which means we are going to be sharing all our available resources equally. I come from like an upper class bourgeois family, um, but I am working class um, and I'm a socialist and I'm trans. Um, I'm Rachel, uh, I use she, her. I'm a lesbian, uh, I'm disabled and chronically ill. Um, I don't know what else. That's all I got. I'm Matt, uh, I use he and I've been so socially out for I guess like five or six years. I've been on testosterone for two years and I just got uh, top surgery. I come from up, upper middle class um, and I still live with them. I am neurodivergent um, and I'm not really sure what I'm diagnosed with. Everybody says something different. Hello, I'm Samia. I identify as bisexual. If you can't see, I'm also brown. Um, a very proud Bengali bisexual girl. It all rhymes. And these are the colors of the bisexual flag. Just like every other Asian queer person, I also love Sailor Moon. Um, and like every other brown queer person, I am a big lover of Shower Khan. Is there any difference? No, I am like everyone else. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My experience for the most part, like most LGBT offices have not been very inclusive. Mm -hmm. Like I'm like I'm a brown person who still very much like, embraces my own like you know, Bengali identity. Like, I still love, like, Bollywood. I still, like, I'm still, like, fairly religious and not completely spiritual. Um, and I still believe in all this stuff. And if I identity as like, Bengali brown woman is not inherently just exclusive. Like, my LGBT identity is not exclusive to itself. Like, they're both like, a big part of me. They're a big part of how I grew up. I think I think it would be important to look at other spaces that are doing this already. Um, the 519 has some stuff, like I know they have pamphlets and um, information. Um, just kind of like brainstorming places that are doing things effectively because that's kind of where I get my information. Right. So like, I think it would be interesting to try and access like uh, sharing of spaces or sharing of information online because most queer sharing is done online where I get most of my information. And then also like I just uh, finished trans and queer literature. It was like intersectional and um, and like it talked about a lot of different experiences but also like reading a book is a really good way to understand someone else's perspective mm -hmm. and so to have like physical books and like poetry and, yeah. and things. So it's not just like, here's how to have safe sex. It's also like, here's Here, people's experience. Here's experience. fiction, here's yeah. a story. Here's like experiences with um, going, like experiences with love and like. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. I think uh, uh, one of the barriers to like fully making the school in general just like, like accessible for trans people or LGBT people is that like the profs aren't updated, their way of thinking is still like 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And when I'm presenting a 
piece of work that's about being trans and the prof calls me a she, like it's clear that oh. there's no there's no takeaway there. Right. And it's like and and it's not even like I was just like presenting regular art. It was like art specifically about being trans, about the struggles of that. Yeah. Um, and I think there needs to be at like at least mandatory something mandatory for the profs whether they like it or not because if you work at an art school in 2019 2020 mm -hmm. like if you're gonna be bitter about it you've gotta like get with the times like, mm -hmm. or just don't work at the school yeah don't work at any school <laughs> don't, don't work in any school yeah like, like it should be something led by like suggested by us but led by them right because they think Boomers, especially. Sorry, sorry boomers. <laughs> okay, boomer. <laughs> um, they don't like to listen to people younger than them because they see people younger than them as lesser, which is the whole, which is how it all started. Mm -hmm. It's how the whole okay boomer thing started. Yeah. Um, so I think if they have someone on their level who's like, you know, presenting the information, uh, uh, in a way that they can digest it a little better, mm -hmm. um, that, that would be just like more productive. Mm -hmm. I, I do like the idea of like a mandatory thing, but also I think it would be really difficult to do it at first because at first you're probably not going to know exactly what you want to discuss. Like starting with uh, the like people who don't want to know and don't want to try and don't want to learn, like you're going to fail because. Mm -hmm. uh, like it's just going to be way, way, way too difficult. But if you have all of the profs who are like in the middle and like want to learn more, right. like if they're at those meetings already learning and then they tell their coworkers, right? And then there's like a little bit, of, yeah, yeah. Like you. we have to like emphasize that, that this would be like our space where we're talking, um, but it's to also have them listen in on the, these discussions that we're having. Right? Mm -hmm. We think that part there's a big gap a lack of discussion and I think that's a big part that happens with a lot of boomers like I find like you know like we don't have that much discussion right like I find like I personally I do have a lot of discussion with my dad right but um, I find like a lot of other people they don't like I don't find myself having those same discussions with my prof which is they're at the same discussion like ages my dad but like you know um, yeah, there's no personal connection there, but there's still like, you know, we, there needs to be a comfortable space where we're willing to have these discussions and they're also willing to listen to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I don't think like education should be like the burden of students, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like I don't think we should have to be the ones responsible to educate the profs. Like, I feel like someone else should be stepping in to kind of deal with that. We're like, we're like dealing with enough shit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Professionals, specifically social workers, they know how to like, like actually instigate conversation um, and get it to go, like, get it to where they want to go and um, might be a little bit more receptive than like overtired students who are like very late on their assignments and uh, barely get enough sleep and food to eat. I also need to add, like, there needs to be a very positive space for students. I think that's not happening, and as people of the LGBT community, you don't get a lot of positive space. Um, and sometimes I think it, there needs to be a thing where we can come into the space and it's like, oh, this is time where you can, like, escape from everything and just have fun and be yourself. does not look like a wheelchair. <laughs> I tried, I tried. I, I think it's like a wheelchair.